greetings, comrades. Welcome to this week's episode of Red Library, a political education podcast for today's left. How y'all doing out there? Hope you're doing well. It's good to have you back with us this week. I hope you enjoyed our episode last week with Comrade Noah on his article helping us learn to expand our understandings of Marxism's basic categories through a post-colonial, decolonial lens. So I hope you were able to get inspired by that, maybe do some reading, do a little bit of research into some of the extra links we posted in the show notes. As for this week's show, we have a very funny, a very irreverent one lined up for you. We have Comrade David on to talk about anarchist anthropologist David Graeber's work, Debt the First 5,000 Years. What I really appreciate and really enjoyed about this particular episode was we really, I think, struck a balance between some of the theoretical historical work that Graeber does, but also just talking about our own experiences of debt, of student debt, of what it's like to exist in a system of capitalism and financial capitalism, which more and more relies on things like credit and debt to keep the economy flowing and circulating properly, and what it's actually like on a subjective level to experience some of the depravity, the burdens of that system. So I think this one for you out there, dear comrades, dear listeners, will hopefully strike a similar chord for yourself as well. I'm going to post a link in the show notes to maybe an article or two that has come out recently on the student debt bubble, which I think are incredibly important to read and and really also give us some historical perspective on what is being called right now potentially the biggest bubble that we've ever had in the U.S. economy and thereby the global economy. And if and when it does burst, we could be seeing a recession even greater than what we had in 2008, 2009. So I think this is a really important and really relevant topic, and I hope you enjoy the discussion. As always, remember to subscribe to the show on iTunes if you're not already. Find us over at Patreon if you'd like to throw us a few bucks to support the show. And most importantly, talk to your friends and people you think would be interested in this show, even if they're not already quote unquote on the left, but would be open to hearing some ideas and maybe thinking about things in a new way and ask them to like the page on Facebook and to check out what we're doing. Okay, without further ado, here's this week's episode with me and Comrade David discussing David Graeber's debt, the first 5,000 years. Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of Red Library. I'd like to welcome our very special, our very esteemed guest, Comrade David. Welcome to the show, Comrade David. Thank you so much for having me. How are you doing? I am breathing, so I guess I'm fine. That's all you can kind of ask for in this day and age. But I'm happy to be here and uh, (laughs) discussing this literature with you. So yeah, 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 big (laughs) thumbs up, big thumbs up. I think maybe before we dive into the book and talk about what we're going to do, I thought it would just be kind of cool to mention how we actually met each other (laughs) and how you uh, got involved and wanted to be on an episode of the show in the first place. Okay. Um, Yeah. So, you know, being in Austin, you know, we have like a good two or three 24 hour coffee shops and um, me being a night owl with a day job, but also an aspiring artist and writer. I was perusing one of those coffee shops was Epoch. And um, I was very fortunate enough to uh, involuntarily eavesdrop on Adam's conversation (laughs) with his friend. And I helped myself to that conversation because I was in that at that time, I was in the mood for decent conversation regarding decent subjects that really need to be discussed. As much as I do like Ariana Grande's new album, I would much rather be discussing, you know, the history of debt and making sure people know about that. So here I am. (laughs) Oh, shit, I thought I thought this was the Ariana Grande episode. I mean, I we can we can talk that. about Ariana Grande. <laughs> Seven Rings is a smash hit. <laughs> well, I guess I prepared notes for Ariana Grande, but I guess you prepared notes for something else. So let's do what you wanted to talk about. <laughs> why don't we Why don't we jump in there? So what are we here to talk about? What's our topic for the day? So we are talking about a nice little. Uh, I would like to call it a persuasive essay. More so, um, it's called debt the first five thousand years it is by an anthropologist by the name of david graber he is uh he's worked with the 
inter- ooh, the international workers, oh, the industrial workers of the world. Yeah, the IWW, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, a lot of I, uh, I am abbreviations and whatnot. He fought against the International Monetary Fund in regards to some uh, practices in which they were pigeonholing developing countries into adopting and taking on debt from entities in the West and essentially forcing them to conform to Western uh, economic, almost political practice in regards to making sure that the debt that they were kind of forced to take on is paid off and a lot of it was at the expense of a lot of social reform programs they already had going and um things of that nature and so he wrote this lovely book on debt and i am here to discuss it i i'm really glad you brought up the imf uh piece too because you know a lot of times on the show and the episodes that we've done we talk a lot about anti-imperialism and try to have a very kind of like global um perspective and, you know, talking about things like politics in Libya and Egypt, uh, talking about decolonialism and how all of these things relate to being, you know, even somewhere on the left, wherever the hell that is, in the leftosphere, as I like to call it. Um, you know, and, and I think talking about debt in the IMF is something that's so relevant and so important to really get a grasp on this stuff. I don't know if you heard this, but I believe it was maybe last month or something. I think it was either the Department of Defense or some big government agency, maybe even the CIA released this report or this report was uh, declassified that basically said that the IMF and the World Bank were just uh, very consciously created as elements of uh, finance and this sort of new imperialist kind of warfare (laughs) tool to basically subjugate countries that were developing social programs that would you know be even considered slightly like left wing and it's basically just a tool to just ruthlessly destroy their autonomy and bring them into the fold of global capital so um yeah i think it's hard to consider yourself an anti-imperialist or being a you know anti-capitalist in any sort of way without having a really in-depth understanding or at least you know acknowledging the role of debt and institutions like the imf and how all of this functions so i think this is uh right in line with what we're doing here it's it's even i'm gonna just we're just gonna continue through the uh the portals that we're creating here because <laughs> it's it's funny that you bring that up because one of the main uh points that graber discusses is that money in itself is a tool of the state mm-hmm. and markets and governments aren't independent of each other markets exist for the sake of government convenience Therefore, you have these entities like the IMF. They exist, and they're literally like your, like you've said, tools, tools of imperialism. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's. I wish that I could go so far as to say disgusting, but as someone who doesn't typically cling to absolutes, I can't really make that claim. But I can definitely say that it has had some very drastic and, um, how do I say, not so favorable effects on society and the way that we operate as a culture. Well, allow me to be the voice of just radical incoherence and irrationality and say, I think they're horribly egregious and violent and need to be destroyed ruthlessly. That's my position (laughs) on it, so... Um, well, also, you know, you were mentioning, I think, a key part of what I understand of Graeber's position, which is that you can't technically separate the function of markets and the creation of markets without the state. Now, I'm not I'm not assuming we have any listeners who would call themselves libertarian or anarcho-capitalist. But if we are, um, you know, I just would invite them to take a deep breath, to maybe do some yoga, to do some mindfulness activities and just know that this episode might be very challenging, but you know, you're resilient, you're strong, and you can get through it. <laughs> that was a level of petty that I, I really knew. Not, not petty in a bad way, but petty in a, you're just gonna say it, and the, whoever heard that doesn't like it just has to deal with it. Yeah, well, like I said, you know, we, um, we like to really lean into our irreverence and being petty as fuck on this show sometimes, so, you know, I mean, deal with it, everybody. <laughs> Oh, man. Oh, I I had something on that, on the libertarian thought. Okay. So, honestly, and this is one of my main appreciations for this book, I feel like, just like with the right Mm -hmm. and the left, and where this ties in is that there is a, there's definitely a divide in the left and the right. Both Mm -hmm. sides, not divided from each other, but... 
their own communities. There are a lot of different interpretations of what the left is right now, and there are a lot of different interpretations of the right are, you know, mm-hmm. from within those specific categories. Yeah. And what I've noticed within the left is that there is a... I can't say that it's... These are the only two perspectives, but based on what I've seen so far, it seems like there's two perspectives within the left right now. There is two popular perspectives within the left right now. There is the traditional, still going through with the DNC's, you know, for lack of a better term, antics and mm-hmm. decisions. And then there are the people on the left that are just just tired, just done. They want to, how would I say... No longer go along with the uh, with playing the game and trying to change the system from within because, you know, there's and what this book kind of does it, it takes that perspective of you know I I don't I'm tired of playing the game I want to basically tear down the foundation and start something new, which is you know popular perspective. It takes that out of the realm of youth based angst and and gives you know more accounts more historical documentation more you know, well-constructed philosophical thought to support that perspective so that, you know, if someone on the tradi- more traditional side of, you know, the left and, you know, the Democratic Party were to, you know, read this book, I would feel like they would have a better understanding of why people are upset and be a little more willing to listen to the rationality and the logic behind that very aggressive, intense uh, perspective. Yeah, I think that's a good thing to bring up, too, because I had mentioned before we started recording that, you know, at different points, uh, I definitely leaned much more in an anarchist direction. And I remember David Graeber, who considers himself an anarchist, was one of the people I found that always struck me as one of the best examples of this is what anarchist thought looks like whenever it's very refined, it's very developed and has a lot of depth to it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm i wondering if you were to walk into, let's say, like Obama or like Hillary's, you know, study in their their large mansions, would you find this book on the shelf? Have they read this book? The worst part, I hate that I think that you would find this book on their bookshelf, <laughs> but I really would. don't think that they would have read. I, I either th- I think that there are two possible. Well, I think there are an infinite amount of possibilities, but the two that I consider strongly right now is that one, the book is on is on that nice lavish bookshelf, and they've just never seen it before, and they just had it for the sake of face. Or they have read it, they very well understand the concepts at play and you know mm-hmm. how they're affecting people's lives, but due to the nature of how human survival operates, it's very clear and evident that they are in better positions than most people in the world, so they're going to do everything they can to keep beating the system, to keep them on top, because when you hit the bottom in this era of the human condition you hit the bottom yeah it's no joke a level an abyss that i mean and it's i'm not saying that like the quality of life is awful because we have a far better quality of life than we did you know 50 years ago 500 years ago Mm -hmm. but i mean still once you hit rock bottom you you, it's good luck trying to build your credit back up if you're you know if if you're, you know, in the wrong place or if the wrong thing happens, you know, force you into some pretty dire situations. And, you know, I feel like if they have read this book, these uh, these financial elites and corporate uh, corporate debtors, as I like to call them, mm-hmm. because, yeah. you know, they're in they're being funded by the very corporations that govern the country. They're going to do everything they can to make sure that they don't hit rock bottom and that their affiliates don't hit rock bottom. Yeah, so. I mean, we're kind of describing what you know, in years past, and I think which is coming back now, we call class warfare. Oh, most definitely. Yeah, that's exactly what we're talking about. Um, You know, it's funny, too. I don't know if you've seen this, but David Graeber actually gave a talk about this book at Google during one of their, like, lunch and learns or whatever the (laughs) fuck it is, where they have, like, philosophers and anarchists apparently come and talk to them about how horrible they are (laughs) as institutions. So I might, I'll post a link to that in the show notes. It's just a wild thing to watch. Just David Graeber up there with the cup of coffee just being... <laughs> telling people about themselves yeah. they don't even realize that's what's going on yeah i mean it's it's very strange to watch it you know maybe that's another discussion for another day about what does it mean that google can have D- david graber come and talk about this book <laughs> and somehow that can be sanctioned in the corporation itself but you know again maybe another discussion god 
I could go on about Google. <laughs> um, Project Dragonfly. I'm sorry. I'm, you know what? I'm not going to go down that route right now. How about we do another episode? We, we'll, we just, can... we'll talk about Google. We'll oh, talk about corporations. The, the F- oh, man. That's more than one episode's That's worth true. of discussion, but I'm down. Well, I made a joke with uh, Comrade Zoya, who was on a previous episode, and we made a joke about doing like a Marxist reading of Star Trek, and I said we're going to have a 25-part series on that, so maybe we'll do like a 50-part series oh, man. on corporations and Google. Hell yeah, dude. It is, it is funny where, that, that where this information, though, it, it places itself, because the way that I found Graber... It was in the most 2019 way that you could imagine. I was, I'm a part of, God, I'm a, a, so I'm, my millennial is going to show on this one. I'm part of an absurdist existential Facebook group. I think I'm part of that group as well. Absurdism <laughs> slash existentialism slash surreal. Yeah. I yeah. think so. Yeah. <laughs> God, I think there's aesthetic somewhere in the title of the group. Um, but, um, and 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 there was this post for this lecture by a Cornell uh, professor that was doing a, a series. It was called the, the Debt Drive, I believe. Mm-hmm. His name is Aaron Aaron Schuster. Okay. Aaron. Wow, that sounds yeah. I'd like to check that out. Aaron, oh hold on. Forgive me. I want to make sure that I like. No, go for it. I have it right they said all this. Somewhere. We got plenty of time. We'll edit all this out. Yeah, Aaron Schuster. Um. He's a he's a professor at Cornell, and so I, I watched some of this uh this very like it's about a five hour long series, some of it on YouTube, and so I found that you know I wanted to see what else he was working on, and I was lucky enough to just find the class syllabus for the lecture itself, and on that syllabus was this book. Mm. Um, it's part of it was part of the uh, required reading for his class. Yeah, that is some 2019 millennial <laughs> shit. <right there. laughs> I mean, essentially, I, I helped myself to a, a free Ivy League education. I mean, not not fully, but you know, partially. Yeah. Cornell is an Ivy League school, right? I'm not. Is it what what some assholes call the lesser Ivies? I don't well, know. So, I, I feel like it might be. I don't well, know. Well, there's like Harvard, but like UT and Harvard aren't the same thing because I know that like Ivy League, whatever bourgeoisie bullshit. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> get that shit out of here. <laughs> um. But no, it's really nice that like, you know, we have this tool. Yeah, Facebook is, you know, used to, you know, for a lot of very despicable reasons. But at the same time, it gave me the outlet to find this literature, read about it, use it for my own independent research and understanding of the world. And it literally brought me here today to where I'm discussing it on on a leftist, communist, whatever you want to call it, podcast. It's yeah. It's it's phenomenal. You know, I think that's a really interesting thing to bring up, too, because in my impression, there's always this idea that like being in these like virtual spaces online and like being part of a fucking meme group or whatever it is. And that all it is, is is about like shit posting. It's not. <laughs> yeah, it's not. I mean, and we're sitting here directly because of your participation and like i said like you know i never would have known this but you and i are part of all these same groups and here we are in person we live in the same city yeah like (laughs) i mean it's just it's such a kind of a cool thing to consider that you know that there are these very like real substantive things about engaging in that way it's just a question of like you know how do you actively build on that stuff to you know maybe get to where you're hanging out with a good comrade on a podcast talking <laughs> shit and reading david graber stuff so it's funny um we were actually talking about luxembourg earlier mm-hmm. it was a luxembourg and one and like the, she opens what was it called again something reform revolution. reform revolution she opens reform revolution with basically saying that well not basically partially explaining that it is through science and technology that that uh, information will be more will be better uh, disseminated throughout the the proletariat. Yeah. Because, you know, back in her day there was a there was a like a meta bourgeoisie class within the proletariat movement mm-hmm. that she was very very aggressively against and she said that, you know, science and technology was the remedy to that illness and very clearly science and te- she she was right is what I'm saying. Yeah. That's yeah. what's happening right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think kind of on that note just to speak to the spirit of the show, I mean, there's a reason why we call it a political education podcast because, you know, the the idea was that podcasting shit posting meme culture has this potential to be very radical and it's potential to educate each other and ourselves and 
And I, I mean, I can't even tell you how many books, how many articles I've read, how many pieces of information in history. I don't think, I don't know if I ever would have countered unless I was, you know, in some stupid shit posting group and then realizing, oh, wow, like this is really fantastic stuff. And I, I mean, there's so much information and the access to it is so sometimes there are so many barriers to that if it's in the academy or you have to be enrolled paying thousands upon <sighs> thousands of dollars every year just to get access to a database to get to an article or a book um so oh. yeah i mean i think that that potential is real you know it's those real are shit. moans of displeasure by the way <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah i mean same thing here you know it was um it was one of the things whenever i finally went back to school after a long time of being out uh, it was shocking just to realize how how hard it is to get access to that information if you're not there. A lot of information. A, there is a lot of uh, there are a lot of ideas that are that are not very that are conveniently inaccessible. Yeah. To the right people. Yeah. And and I think that that influences. You know, earlier we were talking about the divides within the different political spectrums within the right and within the left. Mm -hmm. And I think that honestly, and this, and this is not me being a centrist. I'm trying to please everyone bullshit statement, but there are a lot of ideas and concepts that overlap within the, within the rational realm of thought. You know, if you're not going into a discussion or going into a perspective about the world with the idea that you're going to automatically be a uh, conservative or liberal, there are definitely a lot of overlapping ideas, you know, regarding maybe not morality, but at least, you know, efficiency and survival. You know, between individuals of different political thought. I forgot where I was going. With that. I'm sorry. No, no, I think it's an interesting thing to bring up too, because in some way, I think what you're speaking to is kind of the importance of understanding the kind of like shared like material conditions and concerns that that different forms of politics I think provide different answers to. You know, I think we were talking about you know talking some shit about libertarianism, and I think part of that is you know, whenever we're looking at, okay, we have this situation of there are finite resources in the world. How are we going to distribute these most effectively? I mean, markets are one answer to that. Libertarians, I think at the end of the day, if, you know, the ones who are sincere and not just, you know, they're not just like horrible, irredeemable racists and misogynists who live in Kekistan, <laughs> you know, they think that markets really are the, the most efficient way to distribute resources in a society and i mean i think they're horribly wrong about that but you know i think if an enemy isn't an enemy unless you take them seriously so i sound like a fucking stalin right now. i love it <laughs> well don't say that too loudly they might accuse you of opening up a gulag <laughs> um but no i i see i was about the markets mm-hmm I was really about the markets until, really, until this book. Until wow, really? Because, so I read The Wealth of Nations several years ago. I didn't read all of it. I read some of it because that is that is a brick sort of literature, and you could literally kill someone by hitting them over yeah. the head with it. I'm pretty sure. But you could say the same thing about Das Capital. In fact, that's reason, true. That's true. The only reason why I tried to read The Wealth of Nations was because I wanted to read Das Capital, and I'm honestly not going to read. Uh, DOS Capital until I finish The Wealth of Nations. But that, I have to say, mad respect to that. That's fucking legit. Like, most <laughs> people would not go that far. I think that's very admirable. Well, the, the thing is, we, we've we we've perverted, like, I guess we, I didn't do this shit. I would be honest and tell the truth. But culturally speaking, the, the, the false dichotomy that's been created between capitalism and socialism is just horribly misleading and wrong. DOS Capital was just a critique of capitalism mm -hmm. it was and it, when you look at what adam smith is saying what he's describing as a system of living to support a society the participation in the markets was you know for the sake of making sure that one could have property and in turn by having property be able to produce and as they're producing you know you have a community Community, communism, community, <laughs> working oh, shit. Is that there's a connection there? <laughs> oh man, heaven forbid! It's like an interracial child. <laughs> um, 
it's uh it wasn't a, the, the whole idea behind you know what i would i guess for lack of a better term please forgive me please still take me seriously for after saying this but if the the, the true nature of og capitalism was <laughs> for you know a gdp you know within a country to be you know respectable so that the country would be supported for, or society i guess would be a better term and so you have, you know, several writers, philosophers, analysts, have not, have, whatever you want to call them, um, proceeding Smith. And that bled into socialist and communist thought. After Smith wrote his works, there was a French writer. His name was uh, Henri Claude Saint Simon. And he was very out there. I'm not going to lie. Um, he would go from talking about essentially you know socialist reform to talking about newtonian teleportation temples that led to the moon from like the middle of earth this man was like just he was really out there i why are we not talking more <laughs> about that kind of shit that's the kind of socialism that i want whenever we're talking about newtonian teleportation <laughs> portals it, it's 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 wild because he, he oh man i i could just go on newton newton himself was an occultist though so it's really not surprising that anyone that's true would, like read yeah. his stuff would you know but anyway, the occult is also one of my favorite uh, oh, subjects. <laughs> You're in good company here. I, you know, there was um, uh, not too long ago I was talking about uh, the philosopher Hegel with someone, and there's oh. this book, and I haven't read it yet, but it's on my list that basically says that Hegel was essentially just this Hermetic Freemason, and all of his work was just a way to translate Hermetic philosophy into the language of German idealism, and that's my shit right there. Oh, that's. That's so beautiful. <laughs> I mean, I hate hermetic. I don't. Okay, I don't hate hermeticism. Yeah, I was gonna. I'm, I was gonna stop the podcast right there. I'm, I was like, you're out of here. I'm <laughs> very after. So hermeticism comes from the god Hermes. Unfortunately, Herodotus. He was a to, polemic, polemic, however it's pronounced. The people that gentrified Egypt. It's been happening for <laughs> centuries. Um, took the Egyptian god Thoth and basically a appropriated him to Hermes. And so a lot of these spiritual ritualistic practices, you know, that are a part of Hermeticism, you know, really come from Egyptian spiritual thought. Yeah, it's real shit. Yeah. So like I don't like the name Hermeticism, but the pra practice is fine. But that's I'm sorry, I have really <laughs> went off the trails on those. And back to Saint Simone, he inspired Karl Marx. <laughs> Literally, if you go to Wikipedia, you will see that um, you can look at you can look up Adam Smith, and then if you you know look up people that have followed him, you'll see oh, Henri Cloud Saint Simon, you know, mm -hmm. wrote some wrote and was inspired by Smith, and then you'll see you know if you look at Marx's writing and the Engels brothers, that's how their name is pronounced, right? Mm -hmm. Engels, Marx was inspired by Saint Simon as well, mm -hmm. and so you see that writers such as Saint Simon are liter literally literarily i guess would be a better word the bridge between smith and marx so in order to understand das capital in its fullest context and really you know know what the hell you're talking about and applying it properly you would have to understand and and really understand capitalism mm -hmm. in its original intent which which is why i think that you know reading the wealth of nations before reading das capital is the best way to get a grip on you know What's going on here? <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a great point to make, too, because one of the things I think is very easy to forget or to kind of obscure whenever you read Marx is the fact that he acknowledged that capitalism was the single most dynamic, innovative, uh, you know, truly radical force that humanity had ever seen. And socialism is always, and a lot of people say this today, even like very, you know, very well respected, like very uh, dynamic Marxist thinkers that socialism and communist critique and anti capital, I mean, they exist as long as capitalism is in existence. And that's kind of this interesting thing I always think about, you know, calling myself a Marxist, which is that, you know, Marxism is always in existence as long as capital is in, in existence the way we understand it now. So I think talking about Adam Smith, it, you know, you have to know the thing that you're critiquing and understand where that's coming from to really get the full context of it. And one thing too, since we're talking about 
shit posting meme culture a little <laughs> bit, you know, the, to recognize that Adam Smith also was very critical of capitalism in many respects, the, the division of labor and what that does to individuals who have to just essentially make fucking pins for 12 hours a day. Um, there was this great, uh, this great moment. It was one of the most sublime transcendent things I've ever seen on Facebook where someone got into like a libertarian meme group oh, and man. started posting uh, pictures of like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, but would put Adam Smith quotes with her, and they were like calling, calling it a bunch of communist propaganda. And it's like this is this is your boy, this is Adam <laughs> Smith. Like ah. y'all read your fucking Wealth of Nations, do your homework. Anyway, I just it gave me <laughs> an uh, unlimited amount of pleasure. <laughs> oh no, it's great. It's it's well, that, that just goes back to it. It's just that people don't realize that you know. We've been culturally conditioned to concede to these perspectives without knowing what the hell we're talking about, yeah, without doing yeah. the research. Yeah. And I think that, you know, once you do that, you'll see that there that this it's it's not a dichotomy. It's it's a it's literally an evolution of thought. And there are people and forces and groups of people, call them what you want, that are greatly benefit from people thinking otherwise. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um so on debt. <laughs> so back to Gray Burn on debt. It, it it's really it's sad, but like th- through debt, you know, we're 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 stuck in this practice. You know, we're we're imprisoned would be a very strong word, mm-hmm. but some would go so far as to say that currently, you know, we're wage slaves mm-hmm. because of debt, and. What what Graeber does a good job of doing is really discussing the, and I mean this in the Aristotelian, you know, use of the word, the metaphysic of debt. It, it it's it's, no one really is discussed or knows what it is. You have varying degrees of it. You have the debt, that's that's you know held in U.S. Treasury bonds in which the U.S. is in debt to other countries but mm-hmm. at the same time those countries are investing in the U.S. military with the expectation they're going to get paid back yeah. at the end of I think it's 30 years or so and so you have that version of debt which is good but like you also have like student loan debt which is not good <laughs> yeah so I mean and and and, and it's it's trapped us like you, you can't it's very hard to not be in debt. Mm-hmm. It's 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 a challenge. Like that's what credit cards are. Like yeah. you 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 have to, we, we've been forced to, you know, be in debt to participate in modern society. Yeah, I think this is such an important thing to bring up that debt is so fundamental to the functioning of the economy in any realistic way that allows it to function at all. It depends, it requires the involving yourself or the sort of enslaving yourself i think that's you know that's what a lot of people have called wage slavery and being in debt i think it's like something like the average american family now has something like 40 or forty-five thousand dollars of debt and you have to ask yourself like what is what is the social function of this like what are its impacts whenever just to fucking live and survive you have to max out that credit card you have to take on a hundred g's and student loans just to hopefully get just a maybe job. get a job maybe maybe, get a job. <laughs> maybe yeah no guarantee anymore which is you know you getting a job goes back to being dependent on the market yeah you know mm-hmm. which is yeah it, it's a self-sustaining system but you know on the i think a good you know connecting point here is you you brought up the the social i believe you said social function of debt mm-hmm. um what graber describes he he has a lot of he, he discusses a lot of social functions of debt um but you know one of the the primary uh, functions is that he explains is how it's a a situation in which two people that could be equal are basically entering into an agreement in which one of the, in which the person that is where both of them should be is able to provide the opportunity for the person that's not equal to them but should be to be able to reach that point yeah. or reach that status and at, and that's at the expense of basically a, like a long term investment almost you mm-hmm. know you, you, you pay them back but what Graeber also goes on to explain is that you know one of the one of the um, cornerstones of of the moral obligations of you know 
of economic practice is community. Mm. Um, community, hierarchy, and exchange. And those are you know the three that he discusses on the moral, well, I'm repeating myself, um, on the moral obligations of uh, economic practice. And when it comes to community, he explains that if you're in a community with someone, you're not trying to make a profit off of them. Yeah. And that's what debt, you know, at its core, or not at its core, excuse me, that's what what it was one of its earlier stages. But now debt is the exact opposite. It is an attempt to make a profit off of someone else's disadvantage. Yeah. Well, one thing I just want to kind of comment on that I think is really powerful and really important is that as soon as someone finds themselves or has to enter in a relationship of debt to someone else like a creditor, that there's this kind of inherent, there's a power differential. And I think that's pretty clear. But the other, I think, implication of this is the way that one has to feel sort of subjugated, less than you know, not worthy in some sort of way that I think has really severe psychological and emotional impacts. You know, we were talking about this before we started recording, but, you know, you and I like, you know, we've been to college, we've been to university, but we're like real ass people like out here working jobs. I mean, this stuff, we, we are interested in it because it helps us make sense of our lives. And one of the things I think is one of the most challenging things to grapple with having to enter into debt just to live and be able to participate in the economy at all is how you're always carrying this sort of psychological debt of you being in somehow like lesser than or um, a failure of some kind just to enter into this relationship and the fact that if I have debt there's something about that that makes me irresponsible or not autonomous not you know sort of whole as a person and I don't know. I'm not sure if that resonates with you, but that, you know, someone who's like had shit tons of debt for a long time and really struggled, that was always one of the things that was so insidious about it. Oh, definitely. I 100% feel you. And that's something that Graeber even, you know, discusses as well. Um, something called one of the theories he discusses is the primordial debt. Mm -hmm. um, and what someone arguing in favor of the primordial debt would tell you, you know, as someone who has to go into debt is that. That's something that you need to do in order to, you know, pay essentially pay back the people that created the society oh, that yeah. you're able to so conveniently and leisurely live in now. Mm -hmm. Leisurely. Yeah. I don't see Big much leisure marks. about it. Yeah, no, no shit. <laughs> at least I guess I'm not getting shot at yet. <laughs> yet. <laughs> um <laughs> But um and and so that's he even goes further back. To explain that the the origin of of, of debt, you know, it, it, and and you know, even money and coinage really didn't really become what was practiced, but it wasn't as I guess substantial until there was a mass spread of of slavery in ancient Rome. Mm -hmm. um, there are just a lot of people coming in, and people would you know become slaves you know, in order to become Roman citizens, because mm -hmm. even the, the practice of slavery itself at that point was dramatically different from how we understand it you yeah, know, based absolutely. on the past three to 400 years. Yeah. And, you know, when you entered into slavery, you, you were, you were someone's property. When you're in debt to someone, you know, you're, you kind of, I think Graber would say that you, you become dehumanized, you, mm. you, your, your property. And the only reason that, you know, any that thing would want for you to be able to progress is so that you could make sure that they're paid back, which goes back to the primordial debt theory that I had recently, like within the last five or six paragraphs of me talking, brought up. Yeah. And so it's 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 through that that very that very notion that your honor, um, your person, your existentialism, you're relinquishing that for the sake of getting to where you want to be. And even before the practice of, I guess, Roman slavery, or maybe it was after, I really don't quite remember, but it was somewhere in the timeline. Mm -hmm. And I forgive, please forgive me if that's quintessential to your understanding and validation of my point, but <laughs> it's, it was practice. I believe he says Ireland that people would, choose to be around suitors and people of higher position and you know in doing so you you're, you're sacrificing yourself but you are guaranteed the opportunity again 
maybe not as a slave, but to basically be in someone's entourage, you know, to, mm. to be in their final fantasy party, you know? So, <laughs> holy shit. I feel like, why has it taken us nine episodes to have a final fantasy reference? <laughs> I'm, I'm disappointed in myself more than anything. We've got it all. We've got Ariana Grande. That's we've true. got final fantasy. Dude, I would love to see Ariana Grande's in Maho Shoujo, though. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> she would be a great Sailor Moon character. But anyway... <laughs> But anyway, yeah, it's 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 we we've built a society and economic practice on giving up our our being for the sake of a system, and not even just the system as a whole, but for the intent and possibility for something else to make profit off of our existentialism, our being, and our who we are, so that that entity that is using us as a tool might be able to be a substantial force in the markets. And the worst, I, I guess maybe I can't say the worst part is because that's subjective, but Graeber, you know, when he opens the book, he explains that the markets themselves and the way that Smith discusses them is almost erroneous because his proof and his logic behind it is that you know there are these savages and you know tribes and mm -hmm. whatnot and you know they practice these barter economies still um but you know <clears throat> when introduced to you know at his time modern thought and practice you know you know it, it was the understanding that they were just i don't want to say ignoring the markets but they were basically practicing a very um primitive version of the markets but if you know graber brings up the historical context of you know there are there's no real evidence that anyone any society has ever practiced a barter economy yeah i think this is such an important thing about his work and i've read like other articles where he discusses this but you know most of um like neoclassical economics are just general i think popular understanding of this is how economies evolved was that yes there were these small communities of people they eventually started to barter and then at a certain point like markets and monetary forms of exchange just like naturally evolved and i think one of the great things about him being an anthropologist and having all this research and studies to be like yeah that's like fucking bullshit that didn't happen that just didn't happen <laughs> at all that in itself is a kind of like foundational myth of the myth of barter capital. yeah he, he calls it the myth of barter yeah. mm -hmm. um and it's and i'm sorry for interrupting you i didn't mean no that. no 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 let's go go for it this is this is your show <laughs> It's our show, comrade. Oh, oh my God. Thank you. I, I'm going to self-crit now. That was I, I was implying that there was some form of property over this production, individual-based property. Yes. Um, I repent. <laughs> but no, um, you're, you're absolutely right. And it's, it's through this myth that, you know, he, he even says, Smith himself says that he, he alludes to the idea that it, it, the markets are basically created by god oh yeah that, that, mm -hmm. that they're divine you know creation and if you really look at you know places like the united states which are supposed supposed to be you know operational on the separation of church and state mm -hmm. if that were the case and you look at smith's writing and you know the foundations of what capitalism is because they are based on the the premise of some sort of religious and divine foundation you cannot it would be completely erroneous and ineffective to use such an economic system mm, yeah for a country that practices the separation of church and state mm. and i i think that 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 you know that that myth that people have lived on we've been conditioned to believe for the past several hundred years yeah you know it was what's really preventing people from you know, and, and, and even shying them away from considering the seriously considering transitioning from this form of capitalism that we have to one that's more advanced. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, whenever we think about this myth of barter, this myth of, I think, debt as this engine, which one person is utilizing it to generate profit of some kind. What would you say Graeber's, what does he offer in place? If it's not a myth, like what does he say actually was the case based on, you know, his work as an anthropologist? So what he, the, the, the historical background, or excuse me, the historical documents and whatnot that he, you know, discusses, 
he brings up that you know from the advent of economic practice any any idea of it it's it's all based on accounting it's all based on a community you know recognizing that they need this and this is what we need to do to get this Mm -hmm. and again it, it's and it ties into how and am I answering your question because it's a really long winded answer and I just want to make sure like I'm still I haven't okay <laughs> no, you're so, good I'm and, I'm wrapped with attention over here and and by 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 I just want to make sure I understand your question before I go on this tangent what you're asking me is what is what is Graber's I guess I don't want to say substitute but Graber's I god the far right's really corrupted what i'm about to say the alternative (laughs) the alternative fact yes the (laughs) yeah yeah the alternative facts that graver is offering that would be a perfect way to describe it um it goes back to that foundation of community exchange and um community exchange and hierarchy Mm. that really pushes people to you know practice any kind of economic I guess system. So would you say that what Graeber is trying to say is instead of like these individuals engaging in this practice of barter, what we have to base it in is the notion that the, the community is the ground, the community is the foundation. And we have to understand all these different practices as emerging out of the way a community has to function together. I, I would. Yes. Okay. I would say that okay, I, cool. I would 100% say that. And I think that, you know, we lost sight of that or we have lost sight of that or at least the people that are practicing and enforcing that practice have conveniently lost sight of that. Oh, yeah. And I think that's why that's why we're at where we're at right now. Yeah. Well, I guess, um, you know, the notion of a community is kind of anathema to class warfare mm-hmm. in some way. I mean, you know, the idea, my understanding of, let's say, even an old school Marxist dichotomy of bourgeoisie and proletariat is that, it's the exploitation of one portion of the community for the benefit of the other. And I think from what I've understood of Graeber's writing and his thinking on this, it's very difficult to have a society, a community, an economy function um, in a way that preserves a sense of community if, his, if the way we understand debt, the kind of the, the use of it as a generate a, an engine of profit, if that is how it functions, Essentially, that in itself fundamentally destroys the basis of what a community actually is, what it would be to function as a community. See, and I'm I'm on the fence about that. Okay. Um, because looking at the original intent of debt, I mean, I, maybe not original intent, looking at the foundations of debt, you know, it wasn't to make a profit. Mm-hmm. It was... I mean, but I wasn't there. I wasn't a slave in Rome to Mm -hmm. work my way through debt to become, you know, a Roman citizen. So I can't say what the conditions were like. But from, you know, my understanding now, it's very clear that it was, it's, it's clear to me that it, that's not what debt's supposed to be. Yeah. Debt is supposed to be, and he even explains that some debts are recognized to just be un, you'll never be able to pay that back. Oh, that's interesting. So like student debt or something i think most of us whenever we take on student debt you just there's no way yeah just like, yeah i'm just gonna basically be saddled with this for the rest of my life and <laughs> you know it'll be passed down to the generations perhaps and and he he explains that you know one of the one or just one of the many functions of coinage and money um is to be that symbol of well no it wasn't that it was within i believe um, he discusses social economies versus market economies. And within the social economy, you know, one recognizes that their fellow man might not be able to pay this debt back. Mm-hmm. Therefore, you know, here's this coin. <laughs> yeah. But in, in terms of lending money, you know, and, and Graeber discusses this, is that when when a creditor lends money, they do it at the expense of knowing it might not be paid back. Like that is, you're literally taking a gamble. Yeah, it's a risk. But if you, you know, entertain the idea that money is a tool of the state, as Graeber describes, you also, you know, he also explains that because it is also supported by violence and enforcement, Mm -hmm. and I don't mean violence in a, I mean it in, in the most literal sense that I can put it here, 
not in you know a, a an inflammatory way, but you know that can be enforced by violence. Yeah, that's just that's that's just the reality of it. I'm actually thinking about. Uh, after the housing bubble popped and whenever people were being evicted from their homes, it was the state. It was the police who showed up exactly. to evict those people. Precisely. And, you know, based on, you know, my understanding of Graber's work, you know, based on this one book that I've read. <laughs> um, That's good enough. That's really all you need, really. <laughs> because the state can, you know, enforce the violence to make sure debt is paid off, debt in itself, I mean, it's... It's far gone beyond those three cornerstones of economic practice, moral ep- economic obligation that he describes. It's literally just the subjugation. Yeah. And because we're forced to, you know, to forced into the condition of debt now, we are forced into subjugation. When I was a kid, <clears throat> 15 years ago, <laughs> um, a generation, a lifetime ago, <laughs> we were told. It was drilled in everyone's head that, you know, if you wanted to be successful, you have to go to college. Oh, yeah. So, you know, you, you grow up with that thought in your mind, you know, and if you don't grow up in the nicest parts of town, you really see what happens to people that don't go to school. Mm-hmm. You see what happens when people don't get that opportunity. And so it beca- it, it was almost like an advertisement. It's like debt was advertised yeah. for just just years like student loans but like we didn't know that's what we were going to end up getting ourselves into yeah. and if you don't come from a from a and i hate to sound elitist in what i'm about to say but from a financial financially and economically literate family or background mm-hmm. you're really not going to understand the implications of of the type of debt that you're you know it's, entering into yeah well you know i'm not sure kind of what your experience was but you know for me and my family i was the first person to go to college and let alone like you know get a graduate degree of some kind and i remember one of the things that was kind of i don't know just strange and was surprising was how you get into this relationship and you kind of understand what you're getting into but not really Uh, You know, because you don't have any context for it. You're not really sure of like, what is the long term implications of this? I mean, at least for me, I can tell you that it was like, all right, you know, I'm working, doing this particular form of work. I don't make shit. I'm struggling all the time. I got to get out of this. Okay, well, what should I do instead? I'm going to go back to school and pursue, you know, the degrees that I did. And you know, in some ways it was just this thing of like, I just got to get out of this. Okay, I'm going to take on a shit ton of debt. Well, it's all right. You know, I'll deal with that later. But yeah, I remember going up and it was, that was advertised. It was just, it was almost kind of like this, just part of, it was almost this fatalism. What's going to happen? Like, what you have to do? Yeah. It's just like, oh yeah, well, of course you won't be able to get out of this, but this is what everyone does. But it's just not, it's, it's, it's one that's not true. And two, if that were true, it's not something that we should be kosher about. Yeah, absolutely. And it's hard to combat that perspective mm. because you know you have people you know it's it's just been conditioned that what we're doing is right you know that's how societies that's that's how societies functions that that's how individuals psychologically function you know yeah. your brain your ontology it starts convincing itself that what it's doing is right and so historically speaking we have a society of people that you know are unhappy yeah. you know they realize that there are problems mm-hmm. they're not People are very critical, and I would even go so far as to say frustrated with the point at which at least the American, United States society has gotten to, but because we're so conditioned to this system, this perspective of capitalism, and because of the way that, you know, McCarthyism echoes still from the past today, people don't feel empowered to to change they don't they don't feel like you know there's a way out like you said there's a fatalism there that that's just what it is and that's just not true it's it's literally it is a it is an act of participation and we just continue generally speaking we continue to just participate as opposed to critique because if you start critiquing things if you start asking questions you know if you Start bringing stuff like this up at parties, which I just do anyway. Oh, yeah, that's I do just it all what the I'm going to do. <laughs> I, I just will walk through like a grocery store and we'll just start screaming at people. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, that's my approach. I mean, I'm all about a diversity of tactics. So, you know, people do what they will, but that's my approach. 
I love screaming at people in the grocery store too. <laughs> that's uh, the greatest pastime. <laughs> but um, you know, you you bring these things up, and and you can tell that these are definitely subjects and conversations that people want to have, and they'll have them sometimes. But they're also, I guess, to put it simply, the Kool Aid has been drank. Yeah, like the our veins are filled with the Kool Aid. <laughs> no, I. So I'm I'm really glad that we're talking about this because you know whenever I read a bit of Graeber and like encountered some of the ideas in debt, to me this this feels like a very very personal, very intimate subject to talk about. And you know all the history, the theory, all this stuff is really crucial. And it's important not to lose sight of the fact that this is you know this is your fucking life that you're talking about. And you know, one of the things I was talking to someone about this the other day in regards to climate change or climate catastrophe, climate apocalypse, however you want to describe it. The earth screaming at us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> basically, um, the earth getting pissed off. And I read this the other day. I think it's the best version I've ever heard described of like what climate change means. It's basically the earth going to war with us um, is that, you know, you were mentioning McCarthyism. And the fact is, is that any alternative to Capitalism. I mean, this goes back to what Margaret Thatcher said. There is no alternative. <laughs> Tina is that what we lose is we've closed off the possibility of critique and of imagining some sort of alternative that could function in any kind of realistic way. And so I think whenever you're at parties and you want to talk about this with people, I think people do want to talk about it. And it's very difficult to talk about it if you also don't have the capability of imagining an alternative future. Um, And I think that's terrifying and scary to say, well, how do I critique this thing if I have no idea how to think of what an alternative could look like, or even if it, even some rough, you know, vague utopian notions of what it could be, because the Cold War, McCarthyism, um, you know, the way that propaganda about alternatives to capitalism functions so effectively for so long, it's, it's robbed us of that, you know, that's something that we've all lost, I think. See, I, honestly, I think that the imagination is very powerful i don't think that anything could ever stifle the Mm -hmm. imagination i think that any and everyone can imagine any kind of world beyond this system i think that the and i'm not trying to attack your perspective i I apologize i feel so attacked (laughs) no actually i love this because you know i think a lot of times it's very easy to just talk with people and like listen to things that just confirm your ideas that you have in the first place. But I actually really appreciate that. It seems like, you know, we have different, like maybe perspectives or conclusions. And I love that. I think that's kind of what we need more of is like, we need to dis- civil disagreement. Yeah. It's just... Yeah. And like, we're not like antagonistic or enemies. We're still laughing and like, talking oh, yeah. shit this whole time. I mean, it's like this to me is like, yeah, this is like, you can have different conclusions about things and it and doesn't that's fine. Like... And it's totally okay. So yes, I greatly appreciate it. I think that the ability to express that, that, ima- that imagination, that, transcendent consideration is stifled by shame mm. i think people okay. are ashamed and 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 made to seem childish made to seem intoxicated on phantasmagoria or however you want to put it mm. you know for considering that it could be better i think it's easy and i think that a lot of people will will, will tell anyone that were to propose alternatives you're just being child childish oh yeah you're just lazy you know you're living in fantasy land yeah, grow you know? up get some debt exactly and it's just like that's that's no i have we we can look at we can look at history we can look at logic and reasoning and rationality and we can clearly see that you know it is not beyond a maturity to imagine better and furthermore, it is only it is within the nature of maturity to be better, despite you know at least to attempt to be better, despite the constraints of the present. Yeah, no, I think that's well said. Yeah, and I, I think that I think that a, a lot of people they're they're ashamed of considering better, and I think that you know, I think it goes back to McCarthyism, and I think that's one of the main stagnators if that's a word forgive me if it's it is not. now <laughs> you've coined it of our um of our condition here and of of of, of the uh, the prevention of the proletariat revolution <laughs> yeah 
so going back to some of those those core concepts you were talking about, I'm wondering if you would say more about how David or David Graeber understands hierarchy and kind of the role of that in relation to community and and the other one that we were describing. Community and exchange. Yeah. yeah um. So yeah, the relationship between community and exchange and hierarchy is that it's not they're not separate things, and even. The, the nature of the word hierarchy would seem to imply that it would have some sort of standing above community mm-hmm. and exchange. But in fact, it's it's more so of a recognition of who can command what. Mm. Almost more so, you could say, who can command what labor. Mm. Um, and the place that hierarchy really plays is that, you know, culturally speaking, historically speaking, people have conceded to the mores, the practices, the um, the expectations of people that would essentially boost their the appearance of their honor, mm-hmm. um, that would lift them to that social standing that debt has been used to do. So hierarchy is is more so a stepping stone towards equity. I find that really interesting because. You know, Graeber being an anarchist, my you know they're typically against hierarchy in all forms. It's 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 definitely it's understandable that or it's 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 expressed that you know it's not the ultimate. It's not just because he analyzes that that's how it could function. Mm-hmm. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying that it should be. Yeah, he's not like casting it in a positive light or advocating for that in yeah some way. and that's actually one of my favorite aspects of this book is mm. that we're getting an anthropological view on the subject not we're not getting the the view from just an, an economist or just a student well i guess he technically is a historian you're not getting the the view from someone that's going to be conditioned to concede to the to the to the system yeah, I think it goes back to that way he overturns that myth of barter. I mean, that's one of the things I, I really appreciate appreciate about Graeber is that he, I think because of his, his training as an anthropologist and his historical perspective, he can challenge those myths and not take some of those things for granted that it seems like most of the discipline of economics, you almost, like you have to start from certain points to even be able to participate in the conversation. And he's just like, no, nah, fuck that. We're not going to start from any of that. <laughs> or or we're going to challenge it and show how that is a myth. If you if you want, I can actually do a, a read an ex a reading of, of yeah, the, go for it. the section titled Hierarchy. Here it is. Okay. And it's only... Oh, it's not that long. It's only about three pages long. It's 35 pages. We're going to do a 35-page reading. No, three. Three pages. <laughs> um, it's like five hours of just you reading. <laughs> Dead. That's the whole episode. I could be the next Morgan Freeman. Oh, yeah. <laughs> do you want to just, just start from the beginning? or whatever, Wherever you want, comrade. Okay, and this is on, on a hierarchy, um, Graeber's words. Exchange, then, implies formal equality, or at least the potential for it. This is precisely why kings have such trouble with it. In contrast, relations of explicit hierarchy, that is, relations between at least two parties in which one is considered superior to the other, do not tend to operate by reciprocity at all. It's hard to see because the relation is often justified in reciprocal terms. Uh, parenthesis, the peasants provide food, comma, the lords provide protection, end parenthesis. But the principle by which they operate is exactly the opposite. In practice, hierarchy tends to work by logic of precedent. Indeed, one could judge how egalitarian a society really was by exactly this, whether those ostensibly in positions of authority are merely conduits for redistribution or able to use their positions to accumulate riches. The latter seems more likely in aristocratic societies that add another element, war and plunder. After all, just about anyone who comes into a very large amount of wealth will ultimately give at least part of it away often in grandiose and spectacular ways to large numbers of people. The more of one's wealth is obtained by plunder or extortion, the more spectacular and self-aggrandizing will be the forms in which it's given away. 
And what is true of warrior aristocracies is all the more true of ancient states, where rulers almost invariably represented themselves as the protectors of the helpless, supporters of widows and orphans and champions of the poor. The genealogy of the modern redistributive state, which is which, with its notorious tendency to foster identity politics, can be traced back not to any sort of primitive communism, but ultimately to violence and war. Wow. That's some good shit. Does that answer your question? It does. I think so, yeah. I mean, it's really great to actually get some of Graeber's actual writing and, like, words in here, Literally too. what he, yeah, not just my, you know, loose interpretation of what he's saying. I mean, I think it's good to have both, right? Um, you know, to understand that we're both, you know, reading through a text and taking different things from it and, like, interpreting it in different ways, but... You know, it's funny, hearing you read through that section, I was immediately struck by thinking about huge foundations of the robber barons, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Endowment, things like the Bill Gates Foundation now, and how they have these huge, very spectacular, extravagant ways of distributing the wealth that they have. And it's always important to remember that part of how they got that wealth is through violence and plunder of one kind or another. It may look different than, let's say, you know, the the state or like, you know, the Roman, the Roman state of some kind, but it is a form of violence and plunder. That is the underlying conditions of capital accumulation of some kind. And this goes back to you know, some very core concepts in Marxism, such as primitive accumulation and Rosa Luxemburg accumulation uh, as this sort of ongoing thing that always is part of how capitalism has to develop. So it's kind of interesting to hear Graeber kind of put some anthropological context to that, too. Definitely. And and um, I feel like I need to make the connection between what I was saying earlier, because me just saying that uh, it was a stepping stone, step, stepping stone towards equity what I was trying to communicate, my very pretentious way of doing it, was that, you know, it was framed as, as though it was a good thing. Mm. And that's very much so what I think Graeber is saying in that last statement there, champions of the poor, you yeah. know. But at the end of the day, it was just the exploitation yeah. of, you know, of a cause for the sake of accumulating more wealth. Yeah, and I think something that you mentioned, too, that strikes me as really key is the idea that it was a formal kind of equality. That, oh, well, um, you know, you give us the surplus value of your labor, or like whatever, you know, the... the the extra yield from your crops and we give you protection in return um this goes back to even the basic idea of what the state is in thomas hobbes and in leviathan so i mean it's a, sorry i love thomas hobbes he's, yeah. he's such an asshole <laughs> uh, yeah i mean I, I always tell people that uh hobbes always has this really strong kind of like memory for me like reading hobbes because it was one of those books that i was just constantly trying to throw it across the room because i thought he was such a dick but like it was an exhilarating read because i disagreed with it so much oh yeah yeah it's in that that as well goes back to uh, the whole idea that you know i feel like he he's kind of foundational to the idea that you know oh that's just the way it is there's no point in trying to you know i had the pleasure and dissatisfaction of meeting a lawyer last weekend <laughs> <laughs> just a lawyer in general who no there's more i promise <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> who um basic, not not even basically he literally said that he doesn't think that uh he thinks humanism is flawed and it's not uh it's it's illogical as someone that's practiced you know law for basically half a century hmm. he's seen how terrible and awful humans can be and so he yeah. just doesn't think that it's reasonable to assume that people can just be that it's in human nature to be decent but i think that uh i think that also goes back to look at where Hobbes came from and look at where this lawyer probably came from you mm -hmm. know what what kind of law was he i didn't i didn't ask him i probably probably should have but i was just more interested in hearing what, what else he had to say like divorce law <laughs> like like we oh god like but no like what, what what kind of law are you practicing are you practicing you know who, who who are you defending who are you prosecuting mm. you know who maybe he he recognized that he was defending shitty people but he also recognized that as a as the function of his job was to do that and so he quite possibly just considers that you know it's for the best thing for society for him to continue playing this role even though he recognizes mm. that you know what he's doing may not be the most 
morally and ethically sound thing to be doing yeah well and the the idea that he invokes human nature to critique humanism to me i think there's no greater ideological construct than human nature um you know this is one of the things that for me you know as a marxist is one of the things that i always appreciated the most about actually reading marx was his way of very clearly stating right from the beginning that human nature is something that is always a constant process between an individual and their social environment. And so it kind of, you know, there's always this great meme about, it's a picture of Marx and it's supposed to be a quote. And it's like, oh shit, I forgot about human nature. Sorry, fam. You know, and the idea- No, he didn't. Like like in some ways, I mean, right out of the gate, he, and you know, Capital Volume One, he poses, I think still to this day, one of the most interesting and sort of powerful ideas about what it actually means to talk about human nature and that it's always a process. It's never this like essential thing that is timeless. So whenever I hear, I mean, I think even a lot of people on the left, like socialist, communist, Marxist, whoever, I think that's also something that is really important to grapple with. And to, I think is really has to be a core part of your understanding that you know, whenever we're talking about politics and why do we care about all this stuff and what are our lives like? I mean, we're talking about what does it mean to be human in some way? And if we kind of buy the more like libertarian right wing idea that, well, human beings are selfish and narcissistic and self-interested. I mean, yeah, of course, like those things are elements of it. But to just essentialize those as these timeless ahistorical qualities, I think is I mean, it's just not not being very Marxist. That's what I would say. Um, So. You know, for me, I think it's interesting to hear this lawyer kind of talk about that because I would wonder, I mean, like, what does he think about the social conditions that structure, like, the fact that, you know, these people he defends, whatever it is, behave in certain ways? Like, what are the pressures that force them to behave in certain ways in response to, you know, markets, poverty, you know, depredation, whatever it might be? Based, and this is just based, I'm hypothesizing my resp- my my theory as to what he would tell you mm-hmm. in response to that he would ultimately take it back to one's upbringing yeah which is you you i don't think it's logical to just bring some to bring one's upbringing into every decision that one makes as an adult mm-hmm. because if if you are a human being you should be learning as you grow and thinking about things mm-hmm. and critiquing them and considering possibilities and if you're doing that there are going to be several there are going to be numerous points in your life at which you look at your upbringing and you really start to question and wonder you know what went wrong mm-hmm. you know what i mean and i think because of this and because you have so many people coming from so many different upbringings i don't think it's fair to say that you know Man, I'm really about to concede to an absolute on this one. I don't think it's fair to say that you uh, you can use upbringing as a rational defense for sustaining a system that takes advantage of people, of, of labor yeah. and people's time. Because yeah. everyone comes from a different place. Everyone has different factors affecting their lives and, you know, affecting what they consider to be logical and rational determining their idea of survival yeah well and i think in some ways it comes back to we were talking earlier about the way that the sort of material reality of the fact that we live in a class society and class warfare is the order of the day is very easy well there i mean in some sense there there can be these many ideological sort of um, layers above that just sort of material reality and you know it's to me, I think it's at least important to consider, and this is, again, just like old school Marxist kind of ways of thinking about this, that, you know, ide- ideology in a lot of ways functions to sort of cover up the actual material inequalities and material struggles that are actually at the core of what a society is and historical development. And, you know, in some ways, this idea of like upbringing, you can just collapse everything into that to sustain. I think it helps you to sustain the idea that, well, Society just is what it is. It's okay. Yeah, it's, it's fine. okay. It's yeah. just they, they 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 weren't raised right. Yeah, you know they they're not for this type of life. You know, not everybody is supposed to have this. Not everyone is. You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it's very easy to categorize people, but I guess that's just how that's a part of 
our biological survival is categorizing things. I think that's an important thing too, right? That like, yeah, that we do have to sort of simplify things to categorize things, you know, maybe as part of survival strategies. To me, the question is always, how is that being, how is that functioning within the context of economics and politics? Like how can it be sort of used and emphasized in particular ways that can, let's say, reinforce something like material inequalities of resources and power? Well, my my response to that is it wouldn't be used for that because that would make the system collapse in on itself. <laughs> the people that have that kind of power don't want that happening. That's true. Um, but I think that, I honestly think that if the first step towards that even being a possibility would be the 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 acceptance, entertainment, and discussion of the concept of human nature being so maybe ambivalent, mm. maybe more so just heavily depend heavily dependent on circumstances. Yeah. Circumstances to say that there's one human nature, I think, is is very there are. There are foundational aspects of human nature that's common throughout all societies, all throughout time. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that what I consider I need to do to survive is not what, probably not even what my neighbor thinks they need to do to survive. Yeah. My next door neighbor. Like, it's, and, and once we kind of recognize that that's the case, or that could be the case, excuse me then we can start discussing okay well how can we take this reevaluate our you know the society we've constructed in in, in you know in conjunction with how our biology works how our mind works how our brain works and you know build from there yeah and i think just in the spirit of the book it comes back to you know should we really acquiesce to the idea that to survive means that we have to take on a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> in college debt has you know, I think sometimes it, this gets painted, this decision to do this, which we were talking about this earlier, by a lot of like more conservative right wing kinds of perspectives is that, well, you basically chose to go do this of your own free will. And hence, you shouldn't actually complain or you have no grounds to critique the state of student debt, the massive like trillions of dollars or whatever it is of, of student debt. But I think what we're kind of coming back to is that what you were sold, what was advertised to you, to me, to probably everyone that we know, is that going to college and taking on that debt was a condition of survival. It was a guarantee that you were doing the right thing, that yeah. you were going to be at a good place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, <laughs> I think sometimes it's important to, you know, kind of acknowledge that there's this like really core kind of material, like survival kind of um, appeal at the base of it. I mean, fuck, like, why? Why do we work in the first place? Because we don't want to starve, like because we want to have a roof over our heads. I mean, that's the imperative at the core of all this stuff that we're talking about. Definitely. That's yeah. And and when you have things like the myth of barter, you Mm -hmm. know, at the foundation of, you know, our understanding survival, that 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 really does get get exploited. I mean, I would call it existential abuse, quite honestly. I think that's a good phrase for it. Yeah. (laughs) Um. Yeah. Well, I know we've we've covered a lot of ground here. So I you know, Draper's book is what, like four or five hundred pages? I mean it's massive. Three hundred and ninety nine pages without notes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so obviously this is a ton of material. Um but what sort of points have we not hit on that you think we should just kind of make sure we clarify or go over? Yeah. Um you know, and again it's it's a huge book. I I describe it as a page turner, even if it's very long. So I definitely hope if people haven't read it, that they would, you know, be inspired to look into David Graeber and maybe read it. But just for the purpose of this episode today, yeah, just want to make sure we cover our bases here. I think that uh, one of the most important aspects that's, you know, discussed, it's not, you know, heavily discussed. And I, I've really touched on, you know, more of the beginning and center of the book because, I mean, you can read the headlines for, like, the latter part. The latter part just discusses, you know, late capitalist practice. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, he, he discusses the concept of the Jubilee. Oh, yeah. I was wondering if we were going to talk about this. Yeah. And and how, you know, ancient societies, all th- or societies throughout, you know, time really – practiced the clearing of commercial debts and recognition that you know like we 
it had somehow got on the subject of earlier some things were just you, you can't pay that back mm -hmm. and how i mean that that goes back to the fact that you know money you know one of its more popular uses was also to just you know play pay blood debts you mm -hmm. know oh someone died because of my negligence the best thing i can do is give them money because i'll never oh, yeah. be able to bring someone back to life mm -hmm. so here let me just you know pay you and you know that eventually turned into them just continually giving them the the victim the fa the victim's family or whatever some sort of payment until another human life is sacrificed or something of that nature hmm. um that's really interesting too because there's a lot of times whenever someone experiences violent victimization that's a condition of uh a lot of the actual like criminal sentence that they get is that they have to pay the family back or pay into this fund that will then distribute resources to victims families um it's sort of this interesting idea that you know, the loss of a life or, you know, the death of someone at your hands or by your actions is something that it's like money and paying this thing back serves as sort of like the best case scenario for something that can never actually truly be paid back. Exactly. And, 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 you know, that's just one of the functions of money. Yeah. It, it's not, you know, as a tool of the state, it is, you know, almost like a, uh, a materialization of like an equation. Mm, it's, it's, yeah. it's more so abstract than it's more abstract than, really give give it credit for mm -hmm. it's 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 a symbol it's an understanding it's it's an agreement every coin is an agreement yeah and then that's you know in turn why it can be enforced through you know the violence of the state um well, let me see something anything else here i mean just some quick interesting things the fact that you know coinage just made it easier for uh you know, coinage itself didn't you know, became more popular with with the uh in, it was he was described the age of axiom i believe mm -hmm. or axion one of the two forgive me um but it was uh the same point at which you know actually buddhism you know hindu practice a lot of the judaism christianity and islam when those you know writings and whatnot were more so in court becoming more uh prominent that you know we started developing the type of of you know economy that we do that we have and because there was so so much war it was easier for states to just pay trained soldiers you know in the past they had soldiers but mm -hmm. you know as war progressed and advanced so did the necessities of winning war which required training mm -hmm. um mercenaries etc 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 you you pay a specialist, you know. You can get your cousin to fix your car, who might have read a couple of articles about cars, or you can go to the mechanic that's probably went to school. They're specialized. They've had formal training on the subject. They're guaranteed, at least theoretically, guaranteed to know what they're doing. Talking yeah. about same thing. That, that's what happened with um, with war um, back. So I get there's this connection that Graeber is making between sort of the birth of these like great religious ethical systems the expanse of war um, and the way that sort of money as a symbol, as a means of exchange was also kind of developing in this context as well. Correct. Okay. And, um, and money made it e specifically coinage mm -hmm. made it easier to, you know, pay these soldiers because you can't, I mean, I mean, you could pay someone in like three goats and like, you know, a couple of gold bars and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's just, it's, it's more pragmatic to say, here's this coin and then it even made it even more convenient for them to make that the only, you know, acceptable form of payment mm -hmm. within their societies. So it, it, it literally kind of gave, you know, the, the many different states and governments the ability to, you know, constrain exchange to their to the convenience of their benefit. Yeah. And from what I remember, too, I think Graeber has described the way that markets kind of initially sprung up whenever there were armies occupying foreign lands. Precisely. And it, yeah, and so that money and, like, markets as a means of exchange and, and you know, kind of sharing or exchange of goods were also functioning in this way precisely whenever you weren't part of a community. It was precisely this way that there was this foreign force and monetary exchange, coinage, these things served as a way to kind of objectively deal with these conditions whenever you didn't know who it was that you were exchanging with versus, you know, the neighbor who you're actually in, you know, a situation where you live together, you're in the same community. Exactly. And, um, you know, to add on to that, it's, he, he discusses how, you know, th that system of consistent, you know, 
exchange, you know, from one coin going from one person to another, there is this, this, it's like this, this idea that, well, someone's got to, someone's going to pay it back. Yeah. And you know what, that even ties back into, he explains that, from, if I remember correctly, because it really stood out to me, um, but I could be, you know, switching some words around here and there, but regarding the British royalty mm-hmm. and the the British government, apparently the British royalty is just kind of consistently in debt to the British government. Mm. But if they were to pay that back, th- then the whole uh, British economy would collapse because the debt would be paid. Mm. And so it would it's 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 ghastly almost that that's yeah. that why can't we just pay back the fucking debt <laughs> <laughs> like they i'm sure they have the money to do it yeah like someone has to but if they did that and people wouldn't know anyone any owe anyone anymore from my understanding of that statement so but please do feel free to do the research on that before you before you publish this because i could be i could have really misinterpreted that but it seemed pretty straightforward when i read it yeah well and i think kind of interestingly coming back to we were talking about jubilee a second ago um you know one of the things i remember that like cropped up after occupy or in the midst of the occupy movement were these debt jubilee movements and basically it had a lot to do with medical debt and what you could do is you would go to this website and there would basically be, um, they would take donations, they would pull this money together, and then they would go buy off like massive amounts of medical debt for people all over the country. And, you know, one of the things that I think isn't very well known is that medical debt is the number one cause of bankruptcy in the United States. So what they would do is they would pull together community resources from all over the country, buy up medical debt, and then just basically abolish it. Be like, oh, well, you don't owe it to us anymore. And... I remember just that we, I remember I was like contributing money to this because I thought, you know, this seems like one of the most practical and like radical things that could come out of Occupy and this, you know, cr- discussing the the ninety nine percent and the one percent was an actual feasible, meaningful way that you could prevent families from going into bankruptcy through the co- collective, like communalization of resources to cancel out debts i just found it to be i don't know whatever happened to it but i remember it was just it really blew me away and i've never forgotten about it that was like nine years ago do you remember what it was called i think it was just called like debt jubilee i'll see if i can find it if i can i'll like post it in the show notes and i'll send it to you um but yeah i just remember yeah i mean yeah nine years later i still think about that all the time yeah the uh the whole the whole concept of jubilee it's i would like to believe that it's a good idea Mm -hmm. but maybe it's the the uh indoctrinization and conditioning that's still lingering in my subconscious but i feel like a large-scale jubilee it would it could it could be a very accessible opportunity for people to really just retake advantage of people again Mm. how so i feel like Certain situations down the line in the future will convince us to, or convince people, can and do convince people to, God, I really hate to bring it around full circle, but uh, calling on some old debts. (laughs) (laughs) And you have these people that can, I mean, you would have these entities that would say, look, I did this for you. I expect this in recompense Mm. and they could go on to claim they would be best for the community because as them having the power to do what they did understand what's best for the community and they're telling you that you need to do this now you know in the payment and exchange and reciprocity for you know the clearing of that debt for that jubilee and i feel like you know even if you know it's not one entity that would do that i feel like that a conglomerate of entities that may push for that could come together and say hey we made life easy for you now. This is what we need from you. You know, I think this is an interesting thing to bring up because from what I remember, part of what Graeber is kind of getting at is to say that debt has always been there. It's always functioned in a certain way. And my read on him is to basically say that the question is going to be, is the purpose of debt to sort of bind us together in a community? And it's something where it comes with a sort of 
I guess an obligation of some kind, but it's an obligation to sort of contribute and be an active member of a community in some way versus this kind of like marketized, like neoliberal, like global capitalist version of debt, which is uh, a sort of highly efficient, highly brutal means to capture wealth, to transmit that wealth increasingly towards a small group of people in a particular way for the kind of benefit of that particular group of people that aren't actually part of your community. And so, I, I you know, I think it's interesting not to take the idea of Jubilee as this purely, like very pure moral sort of thing to do, that it maybe would come with obligations. I wonder if some of those obligations could actually be to kind of rebind us into a community in some way versus we're all these kind of like individualized, atomized consumers and debtors that are paying back, you know, the creditors that we pay back are these huge abstract corporate entities and debt collectors that we don't know who the fuck they are. Like they have no real impact on like my day to day life outside of just they send me bills in the mail and they tell me I have to pay this or it's going to ruin my financial future. So I don't know. I mean, I think it's a it's a good thing to bring up. I'm not sure what that would look like. <laughs> yeah, it's it's and and you another thing that I would consider is okay. You're you're a part of this community now. Mm-hmm. You know, you've gotten your jubilee. Yay. I'll never look at the X Men character the same again. But <laughs> no, it's just every time she's throwing out like the sparkles and fireworks, it's just debt jubilee, <laughs> medical debt. Gone. That needs to be a meme. That does actually. Internet Fuck, we should make that meme. Okay, yeah, we can make it. Internet, you don't have to make it. We'll make it. But yeah, it's just it's... we could outsource the meme creation to the internet. <laughs> like now the we're learning. Now we're learning. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it's it's like it. it and who would determine what community you become a part of, though? You yeah, know what I mean? Good question. Because yeah. that would be put into the hands of the people that have the power to make that kind of determination to begin with, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And, like, can you trust that? Maybe I sound like that lawyer that I met a week ago that just doesn't trust in the, um, the good heartedness of human nature. But could you trust that someone that, you know, stood on a mountain of power before any kind of change would really do anything that might you know bring them down to a level of equity with other people i mean maybe maybe this is the deeply ideological capitalist conditioning that i have but no i mean i think we absolutely we're so thoroughly conditioned in a highly unequal like class you know hierarchical racist gendered like patriarchal society i think it's very hard for us to actually trust that people who benefited from those systems beforehand, if you were to somehow bring this back down to, oh, well, now we're all in community and existing together, like that doesn't, that doesn't abolish power. And it doesn't abolish the fact that people can use these, these communal relationships with seem very egalitarian in ways that sort of allow them to exercise power even more effectively. Um, I, you know, there's this great article, um, it's called The Tyranny of Structurelessness, that's about Uh, feminist movements during the 70s and second wave feminism and how in some ways whenever you had this like very egalitarian um, what seemed like a very radical way to deconstruct hierarchies in some ways it just allowed people who were very manipulative and very powerful to sort of exercise that power more effectively because there weren't any like means of addressing power imbalances and I don't know that to me was a really instructive thing that you know, it's important not to fall back into this sort of almost kind of like reactionary idea of community that, oh, it's this um, more pure, more um, sort of holistic kind of way of living. It's like, no, like, I mean, there are going to be power struggles. There are going to be issues and inequalities. The question is like, you know, what could we do to minimize those and transform those in a way that doesn't look like, you know, a hellscape of capitalist society that we have now? I think Kiamu is the one that has the answer. <laughs> and it is his most famous quote. And forgive me for being cliche. I never thought I would reach the point where quoting Camus would be considered cliche. <laughs> I was like, who the fuck is that cliche for? But there are groups. There are Facebook true. groups. Fair like... enough. I was. I should have thought that. Yes, in Facebook groups. Fair enough. But go ahead and spit on. I mean, Camus is very welcome on this show. One must imagine Sisyphus is happy. Like, yep, there are going to be these power struggles. But what kind of world do you want to live in? Do you want to just concede to the abuse and not do anything about it? Or do you want to at least die trying to fight yeah and i think that like it, it comes down to and i hate to be a um well no I, i'm being a deontologist on this you have to you have to appreciate the act of that rebellion you have to find the value you know and the desire and satisfaction in just 
doing what's what you think is right yeah and i think that that's something that we've been heavily disassociated with for the last few decades at least because that goes back to what i was saying or what we were discussing earlier on you know people being ashamed of Mm -hmm. believing that the world would be better you know it being childish or immature to think that things could be different you know it's 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 we've been conditioned to disassociate from wanting progress so and i think that again imagining sisyphus is is happy would inspire one to just you know as they would say on Beyblade, let it rip. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. That feels like maybe it feels like maybe an ending. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? Is there anything else? I feel like that's a good. Uh, that's a nice little garnish. Yeah. For them. Well, maybe just to wrap up, I propose a couple of ideas. One, I think doing an episode us talking about sort of our political awareness, political evolution, and the relationship to spirituality might be interesting. Oh yes. Uh, maybe <laughs> some stuff on the occult. I would be oh. really into that shit. I know a couple of other people. We might have to do like a special group episode on that oh, one. Oh man, oh man. We can we uh can we like put it on a DVD because I doubt they stream and mail it to the Westboro Baptist Church. We can do that. Uh, actually, Comrade Alex uh, has a way to do video recording. While we will make that happen, and oh. we will definitely use it as brutal propaganda against evangelical oh, right wing churches. Oh man. Um, I would die happy. <laughs> well, I think that will be that will be part of our our agitational propaganda that we'll use. Oh yeah, I'll be inflammatory. Let's do it. <laughs> I like it. Um, well, Comrade David, I think just to wrap up, um, I have to tell you, I'm so glad that you came up to me at Epoch that night, and we're here having this conversation. This is like, this is like meme culture and Facebook. <laughs> like, cut, this is it, and sort of like traumatically inserting itself into reality. Um, but this is what it is, and I, I think. Um, I don't know. I, I thought this was a fantastic discussion. I really appreciate everything you bring to the show. Um, oh, I don't know. Man. I feel like it embodies this is like what we're trying to do is this kind of stuff. So thank you for that. Well, that makes my heart go doki doki. Thank <laughs> you for having me. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess uh, this will be the first of probably many more episodes in the future. So until then, take care. Godspeed. God bless. <laughs> so I don't know what that. Do you have any weird sign off things? Good night. Good luck. Um, I don't know. Uh, there are many worlds but they all share the same sky damn okay that's it that's a wrap peace out comrades All right, that's another episode in the books for Red Library, a political education podcast for today's left. Big thanks, big shout out to Comrade David for coming on the show, for coming up and talking to me at our local favorite Austin coffee shop slash hangout slash salon slash den of thieves and vagabonds. We really hope you enjoyed this week's episode with us. And I really hope that you took away something not just theoretical and historical, to add to your own understanding and thinking about things like debt. But I really hope it opened up some new questions for you as well. And I think they're questions we're going to eventually have to tackle on the show. Things like the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the way that financial capitalism and currency markets and exchange and these big global institutions function as very effective, very powerful mechanisms on regulating the flows of resources and power throughout the global system of capital and finance, but also the way that they have tremendous, tremendous effects on local political movements being organized to resist capitalism. Next episode, Comrade Jason is going to be back on Red Library to bring some more of that foreign policy critical fire that he does so well as we delve even deeper to the ideology of liberal humanitarian interventionism and its weaknesses. So until then, remember, subscribe to the show on iTunes, like us on Facebook, find us on Patreon if you'd like to contribute a little bit to the show, ruthlessly indoctrinate friends and family, go to a grocery store, hijack the speaker system, play our episodes there, do whatever it is you got to do to spread the message around, keep fighting, keep doing all that great work you're doing, comrades, and we'll see you back here next week on Red Library, a political education podcast for today's left. Peace. Peace.